Today we're going to do a review of my all-time favourite cheap power tool, which would be this baby. It is a Vivor portable bandsaw, which is exactly what it sounds like. It only weighs eight kilos, but dude, it punches so far above its weight in terms of the stuff it will cut up. Like this is a piece of 75 by 25 mild steel, like hot rolled structural low carbon steel. I cut it up yesterday with this. It took me like a minute 30 and I was going saliva. probably two minutes, including marking out the cut versus, I guess, the obvious alternative, which is great for building character, but not much else. I guess if you did 10 or 12 of these cuts every day with one of these, you could cancel your gym membership and your fitness would probably improve, but who has time, right? These saws are just so good. And for $164, it's not exactly a big risk, is it? And I know cheap tools can be a bit hit and miss, but this baby is absolutely a hit. It is my favourite labour slashing portable go-to uh, bandsaw for cutting up, you know, long bits of tube, like 50 by 50 by 3, which in America is 2 inches by 2 inches by an eighth of an inch or 125 wall thickness. They come in 8 metre lengths, right? And in the context of industry, that's fine. You just sling them up on a crane and carry them wherever and they go into a process and that's great. But at home, who's got the capacity to swing eight metres of anything around. It's just unwieldy. And a device like this is fantastic for breaking it down into more manageable lengths. And then you can do more precise cuts more easily because just mounting an eight metre length of something on a bandsaw, on a chop saw, you've got to get the angle just right. You've got to support it way back here. It's a pain in the ass, right? What you can do with a saw like this is you can get your big lengths delivered off a truck somewhere and then you can break them down into more manageable lengths to store them somewhere. And then when a project comes up and you've got a particular cut list and there are some miters and some straight cuts and things of that nature, you can just break the stock down so that it's like that much longer than it needs to be with one of these babies. And then you can put it in your other cutting device and it's much easier to set up and you get your straight cuts and your angled cuts. Speaking of which, this saw comes in a version, a different flavour, same saw, but it's got a base that converts it into a chop saw. So you can have it 90 degree chop saw, mitre saw, any angle in between. So if you want to make a whole bunch of hexagons or pentagons, or whatever, you can do that. That's dead easy with uh, this version. You don't have to worry about losing this handheld portable capability though because there's three socket head cap screws here and you just unscrew them and obviously this bit comes off and you've got absolutely this functionality. So I just want to run through some of the features with you and I've had one for like five years. There must be a factory somewhere in China that just churns out like a bazillion of these things every day, you know. And if you stacked them all up at the end of the day, it'd be like Icarus all over again, most probably. Mine is a different brand, but it's virtually identical right down to the colour scheme. The only difference being they've added these uh, plastic plates on the back so that you can't see the drive and idler wheel for the blades. But Aside from that, the design hasn't changed in donkey's years because presumably they don't get too much negative feedback. Now, let's uh, let's talk about versus a hacksaw. Like <laughs> you want to watch a, a YouTube channel called Artisan Makes. I don't know what the dude's name is, but he's a really good machinist, and uh, he's an Aussie. I think he's based in Sydney, but. It's, it's a bit niche, the channel, but he makes some really cool stuff. And he starts with stock, not unlike this, and often bigger. And very rarely does he use anything more than a hacksaw to cut it up. And I, I say to him, more power to you, dude, but I'm going to use this, if you don't mind, kind of thing. 
I've been really happy with the one that I've used for years and I use it exactly for that function that I just talked about, breaking down stock, okay? Now, versus an angle grinder, because every man and his dog has an angle grinder. And certainly you can break down stock with an angle grinder, but you have to be a bit careful about that because an angle grinder is an intrinsically dangerous tool and you have to manage those risks. There are the, the risk of impact injury, particularly to your eyes, but also other kinds of penetrating injury if the disc shatters. And obviously cutting big stuff with a small angle grinder is kind of risky because if it pinches the blade and the blade shatters, and if you're stupid enough to be standing in the plane of rotation, you can get hit with the shrapnel. And therefore you need to protect your face and you need to probably wear a leather apron to give you some level of vestigial ballistic protection. And on the respiratory front, it's very dangerous to be in an enclosed space with grinding dust because it's highly carcinogenic shit that you don't want to breathe in. So at the very minimal minimum, you would want to wear a P2 mask every time you do a significant amount of cutting or grinding with an angle grinder, otherwise you're placing yourself at the risk of long-term health consequences. And nobody wants that either. And I'd also suggest that the discs are quite expensive if you do a lot of cutting, right? So for all these reasons, if you wanted to cut up a bit of high-speed steel, like drill rod, or you needed to cut the shank off a screwdriver to make a pin to do something, those kinds of steel tend to be pretty tough and an angle grinder makes sense. And also they're not dirty big sections, are they? So angle grinders have their place, but their usage in Australian shed society, like DIY dude society is grossly overrepresented. And many of the jobs being done with angle grinders could be better done with safer tools. And this is so much safer than an angle grinder for cutting 75 by 75 by three square hollow section or 25 by 25, same thing. It's just less fuss. You don't need breathing protection. The speed is like 400 and uh, maxes out about 470 something feet per minute, so 150 meters a minute. That's hardly anything like a four or five inch angle grinder, which is like 12,000 RPM. Very dangerous if something goes wrong with an angle grinder. The other thing about these babies versus angle grinders is that if you're breaking down something that's already built, like fabricated, let's say, for example, you buy yourself a dodgy workbench off Facebook Marketplace because you like the top, but the legs are shit and you're going to cut them off and go again or you're gonna cut them somehow and extend something, make them longer, whatever. Welded structures often have a lot of uh, residual stress inside them. They look fine when you look at them over there, but if you start cutting them up, the residual stresses from welding occur because the welds shrink and that tries to nudge the metal around and those stresses are resolved, however, in the structure. You relieve them when you're cutting the, the thing to pieces and you're really at risk of pinching the disc in an angle grinder. And if that happens, dogs and cats living together, if, especially if you're in the wrong place. Whereas if you're breaking something down with one of these and it pinches the blade, okay, <laughs> like nothing happens. It's like being offended, you know? It's a bit of a pisser that you have to go and get some chocks or, you know, hold it up somehow so it flexes the other way and unloads the blade, but you're not at risk of injury. And trust me on this, the dudes in the emergency department, they're already really, really good at big facial trauma. You don't have to give them an opportunity to be any better at something they're already excellent at. And side benefit, it's a lot more pleasant for you at the end of the day. So there's that. Um, now, C compared to an abrasive chop saw, they're pretty cheap as well. I think you can get an abrasive chop saw for a 200 bucks kind of thing, maybe cheaper. They're okay as well, but everything I said about the toxic grinding dust, same thing. The cuts are not as neat 
so they need deburring and that adds a lot of time. And it's also a reasonably dangerous tool because of the speed and energy of the blade, the disc, okay? There's that. You can also have a tungsten carbide tip chop saw to do jobs such as this. Much harder to set up in a chop saw with the longer material as discussed. The fit and finish quality of the cut from a tungsten carbide chop saw, really good, but it sprays chips everywhere. Like little tiny fingernails of Satan everywhere. So if you're doing a lot of fabrication, the chop saws, the tungsten carbide chop saws really fast. If you've got to cut a whole bunch of steel up and you've got to do repeatable cuts all the time, it's it, tungsten carbide tip saw is really good for that and they're ready to go together for fabrication straight away. You don't need to deburr them or grind them or do anything of that nature. Whereas these cuts are significantly slower than with a tungsten carbide chop saw. So I think that's that's basically where these sit in relation to all the common alternatives. Basically what you've got with this is you've got a 1140 millimetre blade that's half an inch thick. I think it's 47 and 7 eighths or 44 and 7 eighths of an inch in America and half an inch thick. And you can buy the blades dead easy. They last a long time as well, especially if you're only cutting this stuff like low carbon steel. Now, just to give you an example of what I did uh, yesterday, just to make sure that these saws function the same as the one that I've had for years, I needed these two bits of flat bar for a little project I'm gonna work on over the break. And they're in four and five meter lengths, which are quite heavy and very difficult to pull out and put on a saw that's on a bench or a standalone uh, bigger version of this, right? So I just pulled it out of the rack, marked it out and got into it with the saw. Now, these saws have six different speeds. I cut this one on speed number four, six being the fastest, right? So that was about a minute and a half to do this cut and totally sweat free experience. You know what I mean? Like totally sweat free. And you can see for yourself the cut quality there. It's pretty good. It's not the finished product obviously, but you could dress it up very quickly on a belt grinder and it would be just fine. So this is about 20 millimeters longer than it needs to be. I've got to do a bit of machining so that I've got some counterboard holes in there for an M10 set of uh, set screws. Same with, same with this baby, <laughs> which is kind of the same thing, only 20 mil thick. The first one was 75 by 25. This is 75 by 20. And basically I'm building the same thing. I just want to have a slightly lighter version of additional mass to add to this thing that I'm making, okay? So they're the two cuts. This one I did with a speed on six and it was over before it started. It took like, I don't know, half a minute or something of that nature. So this is a tiny cheap tool and it just eats this stuff for breakfast. So if you're gonna do a bit of fabrication, like with this, uh, I've got some inch by inch tube here that's um, an eighth of an inch thick, so 25 by 25 by three, and I'll cut it up in a miter and you can check that out in just a second. So just to prove another point about this, because portability is huge, you can just throw it in your ute or in your boot of your car, whatever, and it's ready to use anywhere. So what I did uh, yesterday over at the other fat cave when I cut these bars up was I used this, which is a new Blue Eddy AC70, which you can see is, you know, one-handed carry. It's a pretty portable unit itself, okay? It's got, I think it's 768 watt hours of stored energy and maxes out at 1,000 watts, steady state, but it'll surge up to 2,000 on startup for different appliances. So it's got all the usual Blue Eddy stuff. It's got 12 volts out. It's got a bunch of USBs. It's got two high powered USB-C ports and more conventional, two more conventional <laughs> USB ports two GPOs and you can feed it solar and it'll charge really fast. If you plug it into the mains, it's from flat to 80% in 45 minutes. And the price, so I always forget the price, probably because they gave it to me, 799 bucks. So 
that's 300 bucks off right now because it's brand new and there's a sale on at the moment. I will put a link in the description for that as well. The reason I did this, incidentally, was to prove that you could go out into the boonies, like into the back paddock or something, if you had a gate to cut up and do whatever with or repair and you needed to cut up little bits of section to fix it up with or Christ knows what, you know, whatever you've got to do out there there's your 240 volt solution. When you get it back home, it'll also run your computer and it'll charge up your laptop and it'll do all of that electronic stuff. The electricity you get out of the GPOs, like the AC power is pure sine wave and uh, it functioned just fine. The reason I cut this uh, piece of 75 by 20 out on six, incidentally, was just to make sure that the AC70 could drive it on six because obviously six is where this thing is maxing out on power. Now, when you use one of these for the first time, it's really important not to overwork it. You know, just let the blade do the work, just like you do with an angle grinder, like let the disc do the work. Well, with this baby, you let the blade do the work and it didn't trip this once. So well within that 1000 watt steady state capacity, cutting through that in 30 seconds, no problem, okay? So to me, that's pretty impressive from an overall uh, on-location practicality point of view. You can even feed this 12 volts DC while you're driving out there to do the job to keep it topped up, so yay. The cutting capacity of this, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna refer directly to my notes now because there's a lot of numbers, it's, 119 by 119 rectangular in this capacity, like just off the bench, like off the table, okay? So 119 by 119, if you are an American, is 4.7 by 4.7 inches, all right? Uh, if you're cutting pipe, tube, whatever, something round, it's 127 or five inches and Obviously that's for a straight cut and when you start doing mitres or angle cuts that reduces in proportion to what the angle is. Okay, so just bear that in mind. When you put the base on it and allow it to function as a chop saw, that cutting capacity does shrink a little bit. It's 99 by 81 for rectangular, which is 3.9 by 3.2 America or 99 for round bar, which is 3.9 inches, obviously. Now, the 75 by 25 that I cut on four, that took one minute 30 because I did make a note of the time. And this one took, this was cut on six, obviously, and it took 40 seconds. So sorry if I said 30 before. It did squeal a bit on six. And there's no difference between a lathe or a mill or one of these babies or a big fat band saw or even a hand saw like this, right? The, the thing with cutting operations is speed and feed, like tool pressure and the speed, the surface speed of the teeth, right? And if you're starting to get squealing in any tool, like, uh, I don't know, you're using a little drill like this, Using a drill like this and it's squealing its tits off, it's telling you that it's not happy at that speed or at that feed, or it's telling you that the tip is blunt. It's telling you something and you need to investigate that because it's not doing anything any favors. Uh, next step is something breaks, okay? So squealing, generally bad in machining, right? If it's squealing, if anything's squealing, you generally back off the speed or back off the feed like change the pressure, reduce the pressure, whatever. So what I found cutting this on six was that I had to just back the pressure off to maintain a reasonably uh, happy tool, if you like. And I thought it was actually more productive at a slower speed with slightly more feed. So you just have to have a feel for that kind of stuff and play around with it until you become familiar with how the tool works. Oh, another thing with these jiggers is they've got an LED light. So there's a switch on top. If you get it out of the box and you go, well, what the hell is this switch on top? That's just on and off for the light. The light's up here somewhere and it just shines down here on the business end of the cutting process. So. If your rack of stock that you're gonna break down for whatever projects is pretty gloomy, then problem solved. 
you know, no problem do it in the dark if you want. The, uh, the other thing to be aware of with this saw is um, eight kilos like this, 13 kilos like this, all right? So very portable either way. And the, no tools required for the swivel on the base if you want to do miter cuts. It's just a, it's a set screw with a handle on it and you just open it up and close it off. So you don't need very many tools. And I'm sure if you just had uh, basic hand tools and a set of Allen keys, like screwdrivers, wrenches and Allen keys, you'd be able to do every job. You don't need tools beyond a screwdriver to change the blade over. The blades are quite available too. I found a bunch of, there's a really good website that I've bought um, hacksaw blades for my other band saws from called toolstorm.com.au. I don't think Vivo sells the blades for many of its tools, but Toolstorm will sell you five of these for uh, $85.90. And the ones to get, in my view, for most cutting are bimetal blades. There's often a variety of, uh, th uh, of teeth pitches. The pitch is the number of teeth per inch, right? And they come with 14 out of the box and it's working just fine on low carbon steel. So yay. But if you're cutting up a lot of tube, in particular a lot of thin wall tube, then you might want to go for more teeth per inch. You might want to do, I think it's 19 and... Uh, 24 are the next options for more teeth. And the other thing is as the hardness of the material increases, if you're cutting stainless steel or something like that, you'd probably want to go for finer teeth as well. So maybe a 24 or something like that. Maybe a 19 if you're cutting a lot of thin wall tube. Now, just to prove to you that I'm not completely full of it with all of this stuff, I thought we'd uh, use the base right now. So I'll just clear the deck and we might do it with the Blue Eddy, hey? Let's show you how easy it is to use one of these babies. Two buttons, ready to rip. We'll take it out of the mains. And it's definitely the cord to this. I'm not fudging it one bit. We're plugged in, we're ready to rip. Get these samples out of the way. You can have a closer look. That's not looking too bad there. Here we go. So the other thing about the vise for these, right, it's a quick acting vise, obviously. So you can do your gross adjustments like that, flick the half nut back on, and then, you know, crank up on the work so you don't have to spend forever winding in and winding out. That's super useful if you're doing a lot of cutting. Most tools are like that now because it is so frustrating. We'll just disarm the bomb, obviously. And... We might as well. This is just, I haven't checked it, right? This, I haven't done a reference cut or done any tweaking. So this is just me eyeballing 45 on the scale. And uh, you can see for starters that the cut quality is pretty good. That's ready for the fab table right now. You can just put that straight in. Provided you get your dimensions right, you could put this on a table like this, clamp it up, whatever, and you'd be welding within minutes, obviously. <laughs> you wouldn't be welding a piece of galvanized without grinding the galvanization off. The pro tip there is uh, two things. The zinc oxide formed by the electric arc will make you quite sick. It can give you an allergic reaction, a severe allergic reaction, which is known in the trade as metal fume fever. So don't do that. If you've got time, you could just get a little container, a little Chinese food container or something and put uh, the piece in a bit of vinegar like that for about 24 hours. And you'll see when the acid in the vinegar has taken the zinc out of uh, the, uh, off the steel and you can base, it does it on the inside as well. So you're basically good to go. The other problem that people don't acknowledge about 
uh, welding galvanized is there's a small amount of lead in the galvanizing. The same thing, the lead oxidizes and lead oxide is linked directly to brain cancer. So it's just a bad idea. These dudes always tell me in the comments whenever I mention anything like this, they always say, oh, just drink milk because the calcium in the milk blocks the intake of zinc into your system or something. And it, that may well be the case, but it doesn't stop you from sucking on fucking lead oxide. So if you want to open the door to brain cancer in a few years, then just drink milk, dude. Otherwise, grind it off or acid etch it off before you weld. But the cut itself doesn't need any further treatment and uh, basically a bunch of... Uh, bunch of pieces just like this we'll be ready to weld we'll be doing it in minutes right now uh, just having a look at the closeness of the scale and bear in mind this is with no tweaking I'll just hold the ruler up a little bit like that so you can get an eyeball on the edge versus the edge the edge of the cut versus the edge of the rule and it's pretty good, seems pretty good to me. I'm using my x-ray vision because obviously I can just see bugger all of it right now. But I think you can probably get a decent view of that there like that. I'm a, it's a bit hit and miss here. But anyway, um, let me just have a little look now. I'd be happy, I'd be happy welding with that. As long as you get the length right, that'd be good to go. There wouldn't be any significant gaps in that. And from a... Uh, square point of view the other way like the vertical aspect of the cut seems just fine as well to me so if you had a saw like this if you bought this baby for whatever it is 267 bucks or something I'll have links to both of them anyway in the description if you want to uh, pick one up that'd be great uh, you can use the code in the description for another five percent off if you like and yes I will get a small commission if you do that but I wouldn't be talking this up if it wasn't one of my favorite tools, but basically, if you buy this one, you can get your stock all broken down and cut to whatever lengths, you know, to gross lengths, like about this much longer than the finished product in every case. And then you can do the final marking out for your finished lengths, stick it back on the platform for the base, and do your fabrication cuts all with the one tool. And to me, it's great if you, I don't know, if you're Curtis from Cutting Edge Engineering Australia or something, and you've got a dirty big factory with four or five lathes in it, a couple of milling machines and a giant radial arm drill and a whole bunch of other eclectic heavy industry machines from donkey's ages ago that, you know, you've got a big crane and a forklift and all that stuff. And, we all want that, I'm sure, but most of us are in a space like this or even smaller, like a shed out the back and you're flat out fitting a bench in it and still swinging a cat, right? Basically, if you've got this, you don't need the chop saw. You don't need the abrasive chop saw that is a direct cost competitor for this because time is kind of a bit more flexible and I'd rather have a cut like that that didn't pump toxic dust into the air every time I used the saw that came out and didn't need any finishing before it could be welded together, you know, so that's really good. The other thing I'd suggest about the blades, right, if you're going to buy something like this and you want to cut up something heavy, sorry, if you want to cut up something hard like a piece of drill rod or you want to cut up something that's been manufactured from hardened steel don't do it with a bandsaw do it with your angle grinder because that's what abrasives really excel at hardened steel is at least as hard as the blade of this baby and that means the blade will be destroyed fairly quickly at least the the cutting edges on the blade will be destroyed fairly quickly having a crack at hardened steel Whereas if you use abrasives, that's what they were born to do, right? And if you want to test, okay, the simple, easiest test I can suggest is you just get your regulation file. And 
If you run it on a piece of steel like this and the teeth bite in, they're clearly biting in, then it's good to go in the bandsaw because it's not hard. If you know steel, you can tell that this isn't hardened because it's hot rolled low carbon steel. That's just how it looks. But some other kinds of steel, you couldn't cut it with a device like this. And the test is, uh, this is a one, two, three block. It's a piece of precision ground hardened steel that's exactly one inch by two inches by three inches long. And they're really good for machine setups and things of that nature. When you put a file on it, it just skips off. It may not translate like that. Like it's not, it's not cutting at all. The teeth are just sliding over the top of the block because it's hardened. So if you've got your file, you can test any piece of steel before you put it in a machine like this and just ruin the blade. The blades are not that expensive. They're less than 20 bucks a throw, but it does seem a shame to put something in and you're not completely sure and it's so easy to test. And look, with that, I think my work here is done. I know the cheap tool thing can be a bit, uh, these things are freaking awesome. They're very reliable. I wouldn't use lubricant because there's uh, rubber on the rollers and I don't think oil, to lubricate the cutting process would go very well with the rubber interaction with the blade on the drive roller here at the back. So just cut everything dry, just take it nice and easy, let the blade do the work, but definitely don't spend, I don't know, four or five hundred bucks on what might be perceived as notionally a more premium portable bandsaw than this because this, these cheap bandsaws from China, they just, they rock, dude, and they will make things just so much easier in your home shed.